I'm not sure I'll use it every day now. Gosh. Gosh. So good, good for gosh. our prudence, I say. <laughs> yes. What a fantastic piece of furniture. Victorian furniture at its very best. And it's gothic too, isn't it? Great columns coming down and then these panels of marquetry. You know, of course, when these panels were new, they were bright colours. This is hair wood, which is sycamore dyed with oxide of iron, which would have been green, uh, the yellows, reds. The amboyna would have been a bright ginger colour, very vibrant. In fact, it's probably only age which has mellowed it to this sensibility. It's lovely, really very, very smart. Have you had it a long time? I've had it about ten years, but it, my mother had it. She bought it just after the last war. I wonder how much she paid for it then. Twenty-five pounds. Did she really? My goodness. Well, it was a brave buy, you know, twenty-five pounds just after the war. It was a lot of money for what was then unfashionable furniture. But of course it is a local one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Uh, if we open this door, can we open here? Risk of picking a bit off. It is actually stamped Lamb and Manchester. Now that immediately improves the interest to a collector because curiously the English very rarely stamped and signed their furniture. We didn't do it as the French had done in the 18th and 19th centuries. We started to a little more after the 1820s. Gillows, uh, Hollands, Craces, all these people in London and Lancaster, they did start to, to put their names and occasionally pattern numbers on furniture, which of course adds greatly to the interest and the value. It can be documented. And Mr. Lamb, I suppose, is the, the equivalent to Manchester as Gillows were to Lancaster. So you've got a piece of furniture worth something as a Victorian credenza, and then you have an added value because of Mr. Lamb's name and the signature. So, having said that, let's just have another look at it. I think it's quite magnificent. The only trouble is you've got some of the brass beading has come off. You've got most of that inside. Yes. Uh, well, at some time, it might be worth considering having it very carefully restored. Mm -hmm. But remember that it's better to have it as it is than have it poorly restored, because mm -hmm. you'll do more damage that way. So you live with it, you enjoy it? Oh, love it. Well, then, enjoy it as it yes. is and don't bother. Yes. Do you have it insured? Uh, well, just with the general household uh, insurance. Now, I would insure it for 4500 Thank you very much. Okay. Lovely. Very good. So, do you know what this type of furniture is called? I know it's bill furniture, but we don't know how to spell it, or what variation of spelling it is. Because you get different spellings, yes. That's right. Uh, it's actually B-O-U-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Right. After André Charles Boulle, who was a designer and furniture maker working in the court of Louis XIV in the late 17th century. How long has this been in the family? I'm trying to date it. Um, my husband's family were mill owners and they built the big house in 1828 and this, I think, is the original furniture. It's been in there since 1828, I think. <laughs> I think it just misses that date. Yep. I think, though, that this is a French one and it must be a bit later, 1845 or something like that. I can't quite see it as being as early as the 1820s. Uh, where's it been? It looks like it hasn't been used for a long time. Um, they've all been in a room upstairs under wraps. They haven't seen the light of day for oh, 40 odd years. Well, it's a wonderful Dickensian image, isn't it? All covered up and all getting very dusty. Because clearly it would all clean up a bit. You've got pieces missing. And if you yeah. uh, look at this, you can see where the brass is missing. You can see this material here, which is called tortoise shell. Right. So under here, and if you've cleaned it with olive oil, which I don't recommend you do yourself, but you'd see it would be a sort of deepish browny right. colour, almost with a red okay. coming through. Yep. And in fact, it's nearly always turtle shell. Oh, right. People popularly think that this black furniture was mourning furniture. Yeah. But no, it wasn't. It was a very popular style, competing with the Chinese black export furniture yes. of the 1830s and 40s. Became very, very popular indeed. And this good quality metal work, not the best, but good quality, nicely sculpted, with a very good face in the front here yep. on either side. You've got a drawer on one side, blank on the other side stands well, looks good, and this is better than most. So a piece like this, what do you think it would bring? A couple of hundred. Mm -hmm. A couple of hundred? Three, a couple of thousand. Kidder. A really? couple of thousand pounds, certainly. Just this single piece on its own. Right. Cleaned up in an antique shop with the restoration done, five and a half thousand pounds. <sighs> the real thing I'd like to know about it is, is it a marriage? Is it a marriage? Let me have a look at the back first. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, 
Well, I can understand the question because when you first look at it, it's disproportionate, isn't it? It's a little bit squat, a little bit dumpy on top. But, but no, it's not. It's a perfectly genuine and, I think, very special piece. I mean, I love this. Lots of things that we look at first. It has the great quality of a fine piece, but it's naive. It's a strange word to use. But it's quaint, I think, is probably the correct word. It's a quaint piece. It was made in the country, maybe for a squire, who got great taste, but probably low ceilings or a, a smallish house. So he required all the features of a grand one, but he had to get it into a limited space. Look at the door, for example. You've noticed that's a 13-pane door. That's a magic number for 1760, 1765 uh, glazed door cabinets. The other thing is that it's quite certainly made by someone who's been making furniture for a long time. Because when you open the door, you've got an H hinge. Now, that's an archaic type of hinge by 1765, 1770, usually used only on corner cupboards. And then it was going out of fashion for an ordinary butt hinge. But the one thing that's wonderful, look at that swan neck cornice. I, do you sit and wonder at that? I would. Look at it. It just is marvellous, that scroll coming round. And look at that. Almost like a paper scroll. That is magic. I think that's... I covered this piece. If you hadn't already guessed, I... Yes. <laughs> now then, the base part is a very good standard bureau. So the man was used to making a bureau, but he... He was a bit uncertain when he came to trying to fix all that into a small space. Tell me about this. How long have you had it? Is it a family piece? It's, a fa it's been in the family for about 50 years, and it was uh, left to me by my mother in the 1980s when right, she died. Right. And, and you don't do anything with it? Just look after it? And... Just a little bit of polish now and then. Excellent, excellent. There are collectors for this type of... Uh, I use the word again, this quaint look. <laughs> and take that away, of course, you've lost three-quarters of the charm of it. That alone would help sell it. And I think you probably get in the region of eight to ten thousand pounds for it. Thank you very much. Do you know what date this is? No, I don't know. I know how long ago I bought it. I bought it 30, 35 years ago. It, to me, is a very classic part of English furniture history, 1820s. Late Georgian I didn't know that. No. Regency. Um, so it's typical of that Regency period. I mean, the end of the Georgian period, beginning of the Victorian period. So when things were starting to get a bit fussy, but I'm not going to call this fussy at all because it's right at the time when things were very, very, very elegant indeed. I like the shape of it. I like the, the, the mass, the size of it is very nice and generous. Um, but you've had it 30 years. I mean, what about this colour? I mean, we've got a bit of a contrast in colour. If I start here, it's very, very faded, where it looks like it's been in a bay window, and then... Yes, it, it has been in a bay window. Yes. And I go all the way round yes. yeah. to when I get to you, it's um, almost a, well, the natural colour, isn't yes. it? Yes, John didn't like the curtains being drawn. Mm. So he, uh, so it's a, it's he it's stood a in the sun. It's a working table. And it was the morning sun, which I think right. is supposed to be worse. Um, well, it's, it's, it hasn't helped. I mean, it's, no. it's, it's quite a no. nice colour. Mm. It's lovely timber. I have a feeling that it might be Scottish. Whoever made this knew what he was about. An Edinburgh maker, Glasgow maker, who could afford a very good quality. You know the timber? I don't know the timber it's made of, no. Well, it's... Oh. Is it mahogany? mahogany. Or not? That's it? Yeah. You do know the timber. Yeah. Mahogany, beautiful mahogany, very, very nice indeed. Um, I mean, what, what have you had? Have you had it valued? It's a great piece of furniture, I like it. Yes, but uh, I had it valued and I didn't believe the valuation on it at all. Because yeah. I've put too much on it. But I thought it was worth. That's an unusual way round. May yes. I ask you what they put on it then? What did they put on it? They put 35,000 on it. Well, fairly recently, or yes, must have been. Yes. Yeah. About a month ago, Ooh. two months. That that is too much, I'm afraid. Yeah, I know. That I've is too much. It. Yeah. I mean, it's a great-looking table. What I think makes a huge difference to this table, unfortunately, it's a working table. Did you put this leather on? It was put on before I bought it. We didn't put it on ourselves. No. Because somebody has, I'm afraid, made a big mistake with this. This was never designed to have a leather top. No, mm -hmm. all right. This is not a cross-banded edge. This is a solid mahogany all the way round. Yes. And what somebody's done, it was a solid slab of mahogany or veneer of mahogany going right across the whole table, mm -hmm. and somebody has cut it out quite nicely to let a leather top in flat. 
Mm. Yes. So it would have been originally all this lovely mahogany, figured mahogany. If it was made to have a leather top, well, it would have had what's called cross banding. So the grain would be in different directions. It would be this way around here, the grain running like that, and then pointing down towards the back of the piece. Yes. So that's the giveaway with this. Yes. And that is going to make a huge difference to the value. That, ought, I'm afraid, I've already taken quite a bit off your 35,000 right, yeah, result yeah. of that. So well, I didn't believe it myself. <laughs> well, I think you were right instinctively. <laughs> but just before I value it, look at that base. I mean, isn't that fantastic, the edge of this? I mean, that, when yeah. it stands and you look at it, this great big corbel base here, this trestle support with an anthemion or honeysuckle from Greek art. This is a Greek revival of the 1820s. And these lovely poor feet with these great shells holding the feet together. I think it's a, a great looking piece of furniture. Yes. I can see somebody like it, I can see you falling in love with it, and I can see you using it and enjoying it. But we have to revalue it, I'm afraid. Right, yeah. right. Minimum of 10, possibly 12,000 yeah. is yes. more realistic. Yes. Because it's great. Yes. And you've obviously had fun over the last 30 years. But what did you pay for it then? When I bought it, I paid 600 pounds for it. Oh. If only we could all go back in time. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Right, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a sofa table. Now, yes. do you know why it's called a sofa table? Presumably because you put it at the end of a sofa. You pulled it over the end of a oh, sofa. You pulled it over. I right, see, yes. and they were not invented until the last quarter of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And they're quite easy to date because they developed from pulling over the sofa. The, that was a great idea. You could sit and write your letters and recline, but it was unstable. Uh -huh. So the later ones, after 1800, had lower stretches down here, OK? Yes. So from that point across was a stretcher to stop it wobbling. Uh -huh. You couldn't pull it over the sofa then, but it was already such a popular design that they kept the name and they kept the style of table, which is a long rectangle with a leaf at each end. I see. Yes. And by 1810, they, they lost these cheval ends, as they're called, standard ends, and they had a centre pedestal. And it was still called a sofa table, and now people put them behind sofas. Uh -huh. So that's the development. So we know that this one is prior to 1810 because of its structure underneath. Right. Okay. Now, is it a family piece? Yes, it is. Right. It belonged to my greatly beloved great aunt Prudence. Greatly beloved? Oh, I think so. Yes. She left you this. It's yes, lovely. Yes, she did. Was she Scottish or any Scottish relations no, at all? No, 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 no. English. North of England, perhaps? No. No? No. Oh, shame. Southern. But it, when it, it, it has a sort of Scottish look to it. It's quite severe in that, in that splay to the leg. And these are Scottish-type handles. I mean, they're a little bit out of proportion, but I, I'm quite happy with them. I think they're original. But well, we were wondering about that because yeah, we thought as they, they were out of proportion, they, they weren't original. Well, no, I think if we had a Scottish background, they would be OK. So <laughs> I wouldn't worry up. about them. I think we'll leave them as they are. Now, it's made of the most wonderful cut from mahogany. It has this curious sort of grain in it. Very hard timber, very difficult to work. Uh -huh. And normally sofa tables have the grain going across. This one goes along because it's such a wonderful stretch of timber. I see. If you pull the leaf up, you'll see it goes that way. Yes. It's a complete contrast. And when it was new, all these marks, these grains, were very, very strong. OK, so it, it looked very vibrant. This is quite dramatic looking top and furthered with cross banding of rosewood. But it's faded to this gorgeous colour which you could never recreate. So, what about value? Do you have a value on no it? Idea. No, no idea. No idea at all. Of course. <laughs> <clears throat> well, when they're as good as this, then this, this type of sofa table will make between 10 and 12,000 pounds. Gosh. Right. Gosh. It's a good, good for gosh. our prudence, I say. <laughs> yes. All right. Fantastic. Good. Thank you. Well, they were made to replace the original brocade on the chairs, which were in tatters. Right. And I was interested in needlework. It was my hobby, really. Still is. And I got these designs from the Royal School of Needlework in London and gradually got them two at a time. And gradually, over a period of about three years, I finished them. Well, I think the, the colours are quite remarkable because they are absolutely and precisely what they should have had. I can take no credit for that. It's the Royal School. <laughs> I think it's very modest of you. I think you should take every credit in the world because they're beautifully done. They are, in fact, from the back of the pool. When I first saw them, I thought that there was a chance that they might even be original because this colouring and this design is so right for the chairs, 1720 to 1735, yes. that sort of period. 
They are a curious design chair. I'm going to actually stand up and have a look at one in detail because you've got all sorts of designs from the top that you'd expect to see in a 1745 chair. Um, but then you have this solid splat back, which you'd expect up to 1720. You have cabrio legs with carving at the knee, which is fine for anywhere around about that sort of period, first half of the 18th century. But this really rather lovely turned column and then a square block at the foot, which had gone mostly out of fashion by about 1730. So you've got this sort of yeah, almost a hybrid in design, but very attractive for that. And there's no question that these are English and provincial and early 18th century. So there's no question of their authenticity, except I'm slightly concerned about four of them. And you've actually had those made, haven't you? Six were bought as originals. Right. And four were bought to make up the set, including the two carvers. The two they, carvers were not original. They uh, were remarkably well done. And the only thing that gives them away is that the passage of time has corroded the polish that was put on. And you can see here, where it's worn through, the color is, is golden. It has yes, depth I to it. Yes, I see that. And yes, here, this is dark. Exactly. You can see the pale edges. I remember Arthur Negus used to say, dear Arthur, you said, no white edges, he would no say. White no edges. white edges. Well, there, bless him, that you'd find a perfect example of what he was talking about. Well, the chairs, the modern ones, the reproductions, would cost you possibly somewhere in the region of a um, thousand pounds each chair to, to, to make today. Yes. As fine as this. And so there's four thousand pounds for the new chairs. And for the six old ones, today's value would be between eight to ten thousand pounds. Fourteen thousand pounds in all. It's frightening, I know, but... It is, rather. Yes. Yes. Um, you won't mind me mentioning this, that you actually won a prize <laughs> for the needlework. That was very strange. <laughs> My wife was connected with the uh, Scottish Women's Rural Institute. She was the Federation president. Right. And they, they had a show, I think, in this very hall. And they had a husband's class. Right. And, I, and I made these. Made, Excellent. Got it for that. Well done. Well, congratulations to you. They're very, very fine. At Mr. Cutler's in Sproughton. Sproughton, that's near here. Yes, that's right. To be left at Mr. St. A. We don't know Mr. St. A. At the Golden Lion in Ipswich. Isn't that wonderful? And of course, any bit of information like that on the back of a piece of furniture in that lovely old writing has tremendous interest. Lots of furniture was transported all over the country and left at different pubs for collection with the, the next coach or the next carriage. So we know that this one was intended for this part of the world anyway, which is lovely. And the other nice thing about it is, of course, its size. Bearing in mind this little chest was made around about 1690, 1700. To get one as small and compact as this in such lovely condition is really quite unusual. And you use it every day? Yes, I do, yes. Good. And, and it is your family? It's or? on permanent loan from my boyfriend, because I've got more clothes than he has. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Let's have a look. Actually, I want to take one of them. As you take the drawers out, and you'll see when you look inside, oak linings to the drawers. When you look at the back of the drawer front, it's pine. Soft, cheaper wood. They didn't need to use an expensive timber on the front, which was going to be covered with this wonderful veneer. Now, the veneer is laburnum, mm -hmm. and you cut it in two different ways. It's a very, very hard, dense wood, and you cut it either at right angles across the branch or at about 45 degrees rather like French bread, and you get these wonderful ovals that mm -hmm. they call oysters. And you can see those all over the mm -hmm. top. The official name for that is parquetry, mm -hmm. as against marquetry. Each piece is laid on separately, and then the picture formed of these wonderful shapes. The other thing, too, is important to furniture at this period. This is prior to the bracket foot. Yeah. The bun foot is the, is the earlier shape. And if you want to find out if it always had them, you pull that drawer out, and there you can see the original place where the bun feet always were. These actually have been replaced. But considering it would have stood on either a floor in a bedroom, which would have been wood, but would have been knocked about, the very point of contact under there is weak, would have broken away. Or, of course, if it stood downstairs, it would have got washed on a stone floor and rotted. So that's no real detriment to a piece of this quality uh, to have replacement feet. 
So, having said all that about it, has, have you or your boyfriend got it in short? No, not separately. Well, I think I should, um, because on the open market, this would cost you between twelve and fifteen thousand pounds. <laughs> I'm not sure I'll use it every day now. <laughs> you should use it every day. Continue to enjoy it because English furniture, particularly, benefits from being used and handled carefully and enjoyed. These are actually uh, Masonic chairs. This chair is the is the master's chair. Uh, the chair on the end there is the senior warden's chair and the one in the middle is a junior warden's chair and these are shown up by the square on that chair, uh, the level on that chair right. and the plumb rule on the middle chair and that's, uh, those are symbols of the worship master, the senior and junior warden. Right, if you look at the actual design of the chair, the, the framework and the decoration, uh -huh. they are very much in the Hepplewhite style. Mm -hmm. They're straight out of the design book, and I would therefore date them somewhere around 1780, 1790. In, in, our, in our cash book, we have entries which state that the lodge purchased furniture from a local furniture manufacturer in 1806 or 1807. Wow. I'm not quite certain. It's one of the one or the other. Well, that's quite interesting because, of course, the, the styles tended to be used a bit later mm -hmm. in the provinces. So this would have been high fashion in London in the 1780s, and by the time the designs reached out into the provinces, it was a little bit later. But here you have this lovely curved back rail with these wonderful um, acanthus leaves here coming out of the patera, and these very, very striking Prince of Wales plumes um, held in this coronet. Yeah. And then this shaped um, serpentine seat and the channeled legs, which if you consider them in, in miniature or scaled down, would be exactly as you would expect a dining chair of that sort of date. Yeah, okay. And although they, they appear to be almost identical, they are all slightly S different. Subtly different, yeah. Values um, are usually based on known factors, and in this case, it would be very difficult to establish the baseline. But the, the large chair, um, I would put for insurance purposes um, somewhere in the region of £7,000. Right. And I think the two smaller chairs, which are not quite a pair as we've already discussed, mm. I would put somewhere in the region of £10,000. So in total, so making a total of seventeen thousand yeah, pounds. Well, obviously, that's that's a lot more than we've got them insured for at the moment. This piece of furniture was made about seventeen twenty, mm -hmm. and I think it was made by a, a cabinet maker who was already well established mm -hmm. because he was using materials which were fashionable twenty years earlier. Ah yes. And it is a very interesting piece. First of all, if we look at it. It does have the appearance of a 1730s piece of furniture. Rather square. Yes. Uh, it's lost the rather wider appearance at the top, even the retaining moulding, but it still mm -hmm. has these dummy drawers at the top, which yeah. indicate there should be a sliding well inside. Yeah. This was the fashion up to about 1725, mm -hmm. 1730. There it is, the well, which of course was accessible only when you open the, yeah. open the top. Secret papers and so forth inside. But in here you have Laburnum veneer. Now, Laburnum. I'm sure I must have seen, I don't remember seeing, Laburnum cut in this way mm. on a piece of a furniture of this type before. Yes. Now, you know, you can see that it's cut in fairly narrow strips. Yes, yes. Laburnum is not a huge tree. They don't no. use, the, they use the branches. And normally you'd expect to see it cut either straight across mm -hmm. the branch to give a round yeah. or like French bread at a 45 yeah. degrees yes. to give the ovals or what we call yes. oyster. oyster yeah. Now oyster veneer was fashionable 1690s through to 1710 mm. and by 1720 had gone out. This man loved laburnum yeah. and he's quartered it giving this fantastic dramatic effect yes. and when you opened it when it was new it must have looked wonderful. Yeah. I mean, these were bright colours, bright yellow yes. and dark contrast. Mm. And the way it's, it's laid all the way around in this uh, diametric pattern, it's wonderful quality. I mean, you, 
these are all original, the little handles. And when you open the drawer, little ink wells. And look at that. Walnut line. You see, I mean, absolutely extraordinary. By this time, the average up-to-date craftsman would have been using fine quality oak mm. rather than walnut. Love to see it. The mark of a craftsman there. Now, regretfully, I'm going to close that because it's quite a majestic interior. I love it. And we're going to look at the front, basically. Now, the handles, for example. Can you put your loco back in? Fine. The handles are later. Yes, I can see. 1880, 1890, yeah, as it's screwed things. on. Dreadful things. Um, which is a shame, but it's cosmetic. I like to see the shadow here yes. of a, of a good escutcheon, yes. but I, I feel that originally the man who made this with this wonderful cross banding and divided draw fronts wouldn't actually put anything no, very big no, there. He wouldn't. Probably a, quite a small escutcheon. Yes. Um, in keeping with much smaller handles of the side. Yes. Uh, there's so much to say, it's difficult. I, all the things are right about it. The veneer laid on, again, in little sections, mm -hmm. all the burnham. I mean, and this, of course, is a burr, burr you. Yes, burr you, yes. Yeah. It's that magic colour that, that only this period can create. Yes. And when we look at the ends, another mark of quality, a panelled end. This is made of four sections. Oh, yes. Now, a cheaper one, they would have used either just plain uh, timber mm -hmm. or they would have left off the veneer and painted. Mm -hmm. but, but this man went to town everywhere. There yeah. is not a detail, not a piece left that he didn't put detail to. Look here, what we call a caddy moulding here. Just a smaller version yeah. of the big moulding, yes. again laid on in little sections, little caddy moulding, and then he even put some stringing around it. You must be very proud of it. I am. I don't see it very often because it's underneath piles of paper. <laughs> oh, good. Exactly as it should be. Well used. Yes. Well used. Yes. Lovely. I think it's absolutely marvellous. Now, yes. there's a secret drawer. We've got to have a look at that because this is a very unusual feature. You see that pop out? Yeah. Now, there's the oak lining, you see, which you would have expected yes. to see in the yes. top. Yeah. Nice thin drawers, mm. nice thin drawer linings. And that's kept in place by this little spring. Yeah. It's a bit tough, and you can see where people have actually probably tried to force it up yeah. with a screwdriver or something, make these little dents. Mm -hmm. Left. Ah. The man that wrote that was working in 1720. I mean, that's no, magic. I've never seen Absolutely that. I've never wonderful. Seen that before. Just to make sure you put it in the right yeah. place. Altogether, a quite exceptional piece of furniture which is still usable today. It looks beautiful today. Yeah. It's been through, what well, we call it, it's been through the mill. It's had some restoration. Yes. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's part of its history. Yeah. And leave well alone. Leave yeah. it, enjoy it, and yes. use it. Oh, it feels good. Good. Now, we've got to get on to the commercial aspect yeah. uh, of insurance. What you've got to consider is the sort of valuation you'd get if you went to a good dealer or an important auction for it's a very, it's a specialized piece. And to replace it, you'd have to think somewhere in the region of 15 to 18,000 pounds. Uh, yes. It is a very yes. valuable, very interesting, very lovely piece of furniture. <laughs> I think that. Thank you very much. Okay. Do you have any family history which might relate to Scotland by any chance? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Um, it was left to me by my grandmother. Uh, in 19, she died in 1947, uh, but both families originally came from New Galloway, uh, Kukubri, that sort of area. Wonderful. Well, this is a Scottish sideboard. We call it Scottish Sheraton because it's in the style of Sheraton. Ah, oh yes, Sheraton. And oh, yes. that would be about 1790, 1785, 1790. And we would date it from the following features. First of all, you have this very elegant, slight bow. Three nice shallow drawers to the frieze. Very careful choice of timber, giving all these wonderful waves going right the way through. Standing on four of the most wonderful square tapering legs with spade feet at the bottom. The whole thing has a superstructure, which is really peculiar to the northern counties and Scotland at this time, which is this box-like um, uh, structure on top with sliding doors. 
You don't find that in Southern Counties furniture at this period. And here again, they have used the most amazing choice of timber and laid it as veneer so that you get this mirror image. And then right in the middle, not knowing quite which way to go, they put it upright. Absolutely stunning. The colour is as good as you'll ever see. And just enough marks on it to show it's been used as a sideboard. That's what I like to see. If we just have a look inside, <clears throat> one of these, this drawer will do. And I don't really need to because it all looks so right, but those are the original handles. That's what a handle should look like inside. The little round nuts which hold the uh, screw threads for the front of the handle, slightly sunken in, not totally flush, and wonderful quality throughout. Now, there is one thing about the sideboard, which I don't know if you've ever noticed, but it's the mark of the most wonderful quality. When you look at it from the front, straight on, you see four square taper legs with a little spade foot. Yes. When you stand from the front and move to the side, you then see that the front leg is not a square, it's a diamond. And that is the most wonderful thing, because just imagine drawing that, let alone making it. It's the most complicated geometric thing to do. The man who made this was a master craftsman. And the man who designed it was a master. And I don't know if you have any valuation for insurance or replacement or anything like that. Well, if you wanted to replace this sideboard today from a good, and it would have to come through a good agent, dealer, a gallery, you'd have to pay around about £25,000 for it. How much? £25,000. Really? Good heavens. It's, it's as good a sideboard as you'll ever see.